Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's Bible Talk. We're going to begin by singing a hymn, and then we'll uh, stay standing, please, for a prayer. The hymn is 396. Life is the time to serve the Lord, to do his will, to learn his word. In death, there is no power to know, far less in wisdom's way to go. Hymn number 396. Great and eternal Lord God in heaven, we come to you now to ask for your blessing as we are going to think this evening about this important question. Do we have an immortal soul? We recognise, Lord God, that this is a question which has vexed mankind for many, many years. People have thought about what the purpose of this life is and if there is life beyond. We pray that we will give respect to your word this evening, that we'll be willing to listen to what it actually says and be willing to put our faith in you. So, Lord God, please bless Tom as he speaks to us this evening. Bless us as the hearers as we try to discern right from wrong in these things. We're so grateful, Lord God, that we do have an opportunity to be able to come together like this and to read your word. We know that there are people in the world at the moment who are going through some incredibly challenging times, that there are people who are fearful for their lives. Help us, Lord God, to use the time that we have, recognise that life is the time to serve you. And we pray, Father, that you might be near to those who need your special care. But, Lord God, we do believe that you have a purpose with this earth and that eventually you will Bring that purpose about in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would urge you to send him back to this earth soon. So please hear our prayer, and we ask it now through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I said in the prayer, Tom is going to speak to us this evening on this subject, Do We Have an Immortal Soul? And it is a question, isn't it, that has vexed mankind for no, the, from the beginning of time, no doubt. You think of the, the serpent saying in Eden to, to Eve, thou shalt not die. There's this desire, isn't there, to, to believe that we'll just keep on going, we'll keep on going. Uh, and this evening, Tom will no doubt take us through the Bible and help us to see what the answer in the Bible is. And he's asked that we take an introductory reading from 1 Corinthians. So if you know the, the New Testament, you know you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts, Romans, and then you get to Corinthians. And we're going from 1 Corinthians, so there's two letters to the Corinthians we've got, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to start that reading in verse 50. 
and then go down to the end. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'll start in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. So we look now to Tom to speak to us on this subject. Do we have an immortal soul? Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. So, like John has said uh, in his introductory comments there, the question of whether or not we have an immortal soul has basically been uh, a question that has been around since civilization began, the dawn of time, if you like. We go back all the way to the Egyptian civilization we'll discover that they had their own ideas about what happened when a person died. And, and we've probably um, heard about these um, or, or seen them on, on films and so on and so forth. The Book of the Dead was their sort of um, guide to what to do in the afterlife, how to get past the, the, the sort of trials that would be there to test whether you'd been a good person or not. And Ultimately, uh, they aimed, given the choice of anything in the whole of the world, to reach a field of reeds, which for them was obviously quite a good thing to have reached. But that was their idea, okay? The Egyptians wanted to get to a field of reeds after they died. Then, sort of, all the civilizations since uh, 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 sort of had their own ideas, but the, the foundation of the Western idea of the immortal soul really started with the Greeks. They put a lot of time and effort into um, debating this. this. This is Pythagoras. You'll have heard of him from your school days. Kids, if you haven't heard of him yet, you've got this pleasure to come. He, <laughs> basically invented the triangle. <laughs> so, well, that turned out to be a good thing because he didn't have many friends because of that. <laughs> and he spent all of his time thinking about the immortal soul. More time to think about triangles, doesn't he? I don't know. So anyway, he said, and, and obviously they, they debate this back and forth, back and forth. According to Pythagoras, the human soul can migrate from one human body to another, but also to the bodies of other creatures, such as animals or even plants. With each new incarnation, the soul loses the memory of the past. So every time we all live our lives as if we live for the first time. So that was their idea. Quite a nice little clause in it that the soul never remembered what it was before. So. You'd never know that you were living your life again. But nevertheless, according to him, you were. And along came two more famous Greeks, Plato, Socrates. Um, they sort of cemented this idea, having debated it around the table. The soul of man is immortal and imperishable, said Plato. And Socrates, 
I only mention these because they're, they're probably ones you've heard of. All men's souls are immortal, but the souls of the righteous are immortal and divine. So the Greeks very firmly believed in the immortality of the soul. But then, how did this doctrine come into the sort of Christian way of thinking, into Christianity? Because it caused a lot of controversy in the early Catholic Church, maybe um, against what you might think. It wasn't immediately accepted. This was not um, 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 the, the default position in the early church, that the soul was immortal. And the first person to think about this, a man called Oregon, um, he tried to put it into Christian theology. He was an admirer of Plato, which becomes very relevant. And he says, or well, he concluded in, in his book that he wrote there, well, the soul having a substance and life of its own shall after its departure from the world be rewarded according to its deserts. So he's falling on, on Plato's side of thinking, there is an immortal soul. A little bit later, 200 or 150 years or so, this guy called Augustine, he wrote a book. He, he tackled the problem, as he put it, of the immortality of the soul and death. And he came to the same conclusion. The soul lives on in a blissful state with God or an agonizing state of separation with God. And that's very interesting because now there's the possibility of, of it not being such a nice thing that the soul continues. All right. You can live in a blissful state with God, but perhaps if you've not been such a good person, you'll be in an agonizing state instead, living forever, of course. And then finally, um, in this book, St. Thomas of Aquinas, he, he, he wrote, um, what's that, a thousand years later, so this is really mainstream teaching by now, um, the influences of pagan Platonic philosophy are profound. And he wrote, um, da, 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 what did he write? The doctrine of the immortal soul, he taught the soul is the conscious intellect and cannot be destroyed. So you can see perhaps how, how those ideas, well, started. All civilizations have had them. Um, the sort of Western side of things started with the Greeks and then the, the, the Christian Catholic teaching uh, took those and, and, and almost made them... Um, well, a fact of life, really. If you look in the dictionary, um, under the what is the soul, you know, you look up soul, the word soul, and it will say, well, the soul is the spiritual part of a person, a spiritual being. And so it's basically passed into life now. It, there is an immortal soul, according to, you know, Christian teaching, according to the dictionary. If you look it up, it's accepted as, as, as fact. And I suppose, well, the, these thoughts and these ideas are nice, aren't they? What, why wouldn't you want to live forever? Some part of you to live forever. A couple of quotes here. Uh, you may have heard of these people. Helen Keller um, says, I believe in the immortality of the soul because I have within me immortal longing. Now, I'm not sure about the, the logic of that statement, whether just because you want something to happen, it makes it fact, but a lot of people want it to happen, don't they? They want to have or believe in an immortal soul. And there's, there's been subsequent books written on it. Well, this is fine, isn't it? Except, as we alluded to in, in one of the quotes there, if there is an immortal soul, as, as many people today would believe, um, well, something good has ha got to happen to them if that soul is good, and something bad has got to happen to them if that soul is bad, surely. And so from a single, what we're going to hopefully show is, a, is, a, is a, a, a doctrinal falsehood, spring a number of other um, doctrinal falsehoods as well. So heaven, if you've been a good soul, then you'll go to heaven. We would suggest that is not quite what the Bible teaches, or not at all what the Bible teaches. And 
If you've been a bad soul, well, you deserve to be punished. And so hell and, and, and hell fire, we suggest, were invented for those souls. And so we've got to be very careful when we come to the Bible, because from a single wrong doctrine, we might be led down the garden path into several other wrong doctrines. Well, that, that's all, all well and good, isn't it? So, I mean, we could discuss this all, all day. I could ask you for your ideas, and, and we could have different ideas, and we could ask the Greeks for their ideas, and it really doesn't matter, because we couldn't prove it one way or the other. No one has come back from the dead to say, this person's right or this person's right. So the only way to answer this question is to... to have a foundation on which to base this. We've got to agree a foundation, and then we can build an argument on that foundation. And of course, you've come to, to Mumble's Hall today. Hopefully you know all we do is base our beliefs and our foundations on the Bible. So that's what we're going to do today. I can't argue theologically um, about whether there's a soul or not. What I can say is, the Bible is definitive on whether there is an immortal soul. If you believe the Bible, I can show you what the Bible says about that. And that's what we're going to do. Because this is the word of God. Everything we say, everything we believe is based only upon what is in the Bible. It doesn't matter what men say. It's only what God says that matters. So let's go back to the, the very beginning of our Bibles. Turn this up if, if you've got a Bible on you. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. We're talking about the soul. Genesis 2 verse 7 is the first occurrence in English in the Bible of that word soul. Let's read what it says there. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we read that carefully. There's a few words there that give us a few pointers as to, to, to what, what is happening. Let's read it again. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the picture we've got is that God has formed man of the dust of the ground. He's breathed into his nostrils what is termed the breath of life, and he has caused that um, sort of image of dust to become a living being. Now notice, we say we read it carefully, that man is not given a living soul. Man is not given an immortal soul. Man becomes a living soul. So it's not a separate part of him. It's the same, one and the same, as that breath of life within him. I suppose that the conflict of ideas um, that comes about between what, what God says is the truth and what perhaps we would like to think is, is, is a nicer thing or, 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 or our own ideas starts really in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3, still very early on in the um, creation story. So God has created Adam, who's become a living soul, He's created his wife, Eve, and they're put in this garden, and God says to them, look, look after it for me. You can, you can do whatever you like. I, I, there's just one rule that I want you to stick to. Only one rule. You can, you know, you've got the run of the whole of the place otherwise. Genesis 3, verse 3, God says, of the fruit that is of the tree in the middle of the garden, God says, you shall not eat it, Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
So one rule, don't eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. If you do, I'm telling you, you will die, says God. But the very next verse, along comes the serpent. Genesis 3, verse 4. Eva's just told the serpent exactly what God had said. We can't eat it because we'll die. And the serpent says to the woman, Ah, oh, don't worry about that. You shall not surely die. Well, he's told a lie now. And Eve has to make a choice. Does she trust God who has said, I've told you you're going to die? Does she trust the serpent who says, don't worry about what God has said, you're not going to die? And if we know the story, well, we know how this ended up. Eve listened to the serpent and, and well, we'll come to that in a second. She died. But the, the point I'm trying to make is we've got to make a choice, isn't it? That serpent comes to represent throughout the Bible. Um, it was a literal, literal serpent here, but as it progresses through the Bible, it comes to represent opposition to what God has said. It comes to represent evil. Um, it comes to represent sin. So we've got two lines of thinking. God's thinking or man's thinking, represented by the serpent. Whose thinking are we going to follow? Well, verse 19, like I said, um, the punishment was indeed just as God had, had, had pronounced. In the sweat of thy face, he says to Adam, you shall eat your bread. You're going to have to work hard now until you return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So God was right. The serpent was wrong. Adam was going to die. So we find that in Genesis 5, verse 5. Indeed, Adam did die. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. But that word soul in Genesis 2, verse 7, is not the first occurrence of the word in the Bible. Um, maybe you know the Old Testament is written in the Hebrew language. Um, so if we looked up the word soul in its Hebrew language, we'd find out several interesting facts about it. First of all, it's translated from, from the Hebrew word nephesh, for those of you who like Hebrew words. But that means we can look at nephesh, wherever that word occurs in the Bible, and find out exactly what this word soul means. We can put it in its context in a lot of cases. It literally means a breathing creature. So that's all the Bible says a soul is. Something that breathes. It doesn't say if it's immortal. It just says it's something that breathes, a breathing creature. And it's found 754 times in the Old Testament. Here's how it's used. Because sometimes the translators, according to the context of what they're translating, couldn't write a single word um, for, for, for the word soul, as we're going to call it. It had to be translated into context. But it's all the word nephesh. As you can see, mostly it's translated soul. It's also translated life, which is interesting, person, mind, heart. It's translated a lot more than the word soul. So perhaps that indicates to us, if we really want to understand the meaning behind that word, we're going to have to study the word soul, or nephesh, I should say, through the whole of the Old Testament. And perhaps if we do that, we're going to find that any sort of um, um, preconceived ideas about what a soul is, is going to be a little more difficult to apply to some of the times that it occurs. Let's go back then to the first five occurrences of that word nephesh. 
We only have to go back to Genesis chapter 1. We tend to um, apply the word soul to, to humans, don't we? Human beings have a soul. Well, how does the Bible apply it? First occurrence is in Genesis 1 verse 20. I don't know what Bible you're using, um, but certainly the one I've got, it's got a marginal reference, um, which translates it uh, slightly. Ooh. Slightly differently. That was loud, wasn't it? Um, so you might want to just scan your marginal reference. But anyway, the moving creature, verse, chapter 1, verse 20, that hath life in the margin, that hath a soul, you might see. But that, that's not talking about humans. That's talking about um, uh, fish in that instance. The next time it's used, every creature, verse 21, that moveth, that word creature, is the word soul. So that word soul, what we're trying to show here, is not just applied to us. It's applied to fish, it's applied to birds. Um, verse 24, the living creatures, the cattle, the beasts. The word creature there is soul. So, you know, the cows and the, the sheep and the horses all have a soul. Every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. Verse 30. So that's an interesting one to think about. We've sort of said um, the soul is, is synonymous with God breathing the breath of life into man, isn't it? Well, here it's translated that, like that. Whatever has life, whatever has, perhaps your margin says, a soul. Finally, this chapter 2, verse 7, as we've read, man became a living soul. So you can see there's no distinction made between a man and an animal in this respect. They've all got a soul. They all have life. So what happens to the soul of a man must happen and apply to the soul of an animal as well. So I just want to run through, we saw that list of, of 700 and however many it was, um, translations of the word soul. Well, I've sorted a couple of those into, into groups. We're only going to whip through these, but we just want to look at what can a soul do? Um, because it might be enlightening for us to do so. First of all, the Bible tells us that souls can be born. So, Genesis 46, verse 18, says, And these she bore unto Jacob even 16 souls. So Jacob had, in this case, 16 children, um, which were born unto him, and they're described as 16 souls. All the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. So even in, in the context that we're reading it there, it just means, we'd, we'd say, it's just people, isn't it? He had 70 kids in this case. The Bible says 70 living creatures, 70 souls. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins. So the point is that a soul is born. It didn't pre-exist. It was born into the world. Secondly, souls can eat and drink. They need something to keep them going. Deuteronomy 12 tells us, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh. So it's not a, a sort of ethereal object. It needs food. This soul needs to eat. Also needs to drink. Proverbs 25 verse 25, as cold waters to a thirsty soul. So is good news from, the, from a far country. So whatever a soul is, it needs the basic necessities of life, food and water, to survive. Souls can hear and touch. So sometimes we, th we think, you know, a soul is a bit of a ghostly-like thing and, 
And well, you know, girls, ghosts don't exist, but if they did, they couldn't touch things, could they? You know, they walk through walls and, and so on and so forth. See Harry Potter for more details, perhaps. But um, souls can hear and touch, according to the Bible. If a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, or if a soul touch any unclean thing. So a soul has senses, it, it, can, it can touch solid objects, it can listen to conversations that are happening. Well, this is an interesting one. The Bible tells us that souls can die. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. That's talking about a million people or so, um, the, the Israelites as they wandered through, through the wilderness. A million of them died, the whole generation died, and God says, he didn't spare the, any of their souls from death. A million souls died. He gave their life over to the pestilence. And, and, and just the sort of, um, out of interest, that, that's, that's a, a parallel statement, isn't it? He spared not their soul from death. He gave their life over to the pestilence. So it's comparing the soul and the life as if they're one and the same thing. Let's turn this up. Keep our... Fingers moving. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Perhaps a, a fairly difficult one to find. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Just after the, the middle of the Bible. to reinforce that idea that a soul can die. It, it doesn't live forever. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, all souls are mine, says God. Well, we saw that in Genesis, didn't we, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. Every soul that has come since has the breath of life within it. Well, God says, that's my breath. All souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And here's the clincher. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible, well, so far, it certainly doesn't seem to be talking about immortal souls, does it? Anyway, let's press on. Oh, that's clever. I don't know what I've done there. Souls can be destroyed, just in case we're in any doubt. A couple of verses to show that beyond doubt, a soul can be destroyed. It does not last forever. They have devoured souls, and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain, it says in Ezekiel. But perhaps one that's, that's slightly easier to, to comprehend and understand. In Acts chapter 3, every soul which will not hear that prophet, shall be destroyed. That prophet is, is Jesus in the context of Acts chapter 3. So anyone who doesn't listen to the words of Jesus will be destroyed. That soul will be destroyed. Let's have a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, please. Because... From what we've looked at so far, all right, it, it, it definitely is an attractive thought, isn't it? That's why, why so many people, so many cultures sort of um, have developed this idea. It, it would be lovely if the soul lived on forever, if the soul was immortal. Well, unfortunately, the Bible at the moment is saying that for the majority of people, this life is all we have. The soul, your soul, will be destroyed. Now, I say the majority of people because it's not all doom and gloom at all. I'll explain that the hope that we can have a little bit later, which is a, a far more positive and exciting hope. But, but as a general rule, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6, which I think is um, where the first hymn we sang was, was from, the Bible tells us 
The living know that they shall die. When you're alive, you, you can think, but actually you really know that, that at the end of the day, you're, you're going to die, but at least you can think. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. The Bible tells us that for a certain group of people, they'll live their life, they'll be able to enjoy life and, 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 and everything that comes along with life. But one day, they'll die and that'll be it. Blackness. They won't be able to think. They won't be able to enjoy life anymore. They, they, they won't have another chance of, of living on as something else. The Bible says, they know not anything. The memory of them is forgotten. For those people, that is the end. In fact, David, um, in one of his psalms, David was a, a, a king. Um, he, he, he's a very famous king in, in the Bible. He loved writing psalms. He loved serving God in this life. He loved trying to do what he could um, um, for God. He laments the fact in Psalm, chapter, in Psalm 6, verse 5, that in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? He knew that come the death of himself or any other person, that was it. There was no more communication with God. Well, we've looked so far at, at the soul in the, in the Old Testament. Um, we could do the same for the word soul in the New Testament, um, the word suke. Um, a good way of linking the two together, actually, uh, is when an Old Testament verse is quoted in the New Testament, because that gives us both the words in their original, and then we can sort of follow up that new word, suke, and see how that is used in the New Testament. But in summary, supplied just like the, uh, the, in the Old Testament, it's applied to human life in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and it's applied to animal life. Matthew 10, verse 28, just to summarize, I suppose, that was it the last one we looked at in the Old Testament, that a soul can be destroyed? Well, Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter 10, Verse 28, he's talking um, to, to, to the people there. He says, fear not them which can kill the bo body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the point we want to take from that is just that a soul, again, can be destroyed. Fear him which is able to destroy the soul. Let's think about the immortal bit then. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible will you find the words immortal and soul together? That's quite a surprising fact, I suggest, if you believe in the immortal soul. Because if it's not mentioned in the Bible, where did it come from? In fact, that the word immortal itself is only used on six times in the Bible, which isn't very much at all, is it? But they're very interesting where it is used. So let's quickly have a look at those. They'll all be up on the screen there. But I want, what, what I want you to note is the progression now of, of the thoughts as we look at just six occurrences of that word because it's going to start with God then it's going to include Jesus and then it's going to include us okay so this is where you know what we've said so far you might be thinking well that's not great is it if a soul is going to die and that's the end of it 
well, I'm not very happy, but what's the point in, in, in all of this? There's got to be some positive, isn't there? Well, this, we're going to start looking at the positive now. So the progression, okay, is what we're thinking about. This Timothy, well, Timothy had, had, has quite a bit of input into this, tells us, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. So to start with, we're being told there is only one immortal being, and that is God. And so he backs that up in 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. He says, God only hath immortality. However, in 2 Timothy, a couple of chapters on, he sort of dangles a bit of a carrot, doesn't he? He says, well, first of all, God only hath immortality, but now Jesus Christ has come along, and through what Jesus Christ has done, he's brought life and immortality to light. There's a little bit of hope now, isn't there? Whatever Christ Jesus has done, whatever he's achieved, somehow that immortality which only God has is now available to other people. Romans 2 verse 7, and this is where we start to become involved, tells us, well, if you want to be part of that, if you want a bit of that um, sort of promise to be applied to you, you've got to do some things, first of all. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for immortality. So there is a way, we might not have it inherently, we might not have an immortal soul, but there is a way in which we can um, be granted immortality because of what Jesus has done, and that is through our actions, patience in well-doing. Finally, it tells us, like the, the, uh, in the reading that John read for us, when this will be done, um, this mortal must put on immortality. So here's the hope, okay? We, we, we don't have immortality right now. We don't have an immortal soul. The Bible tells us only God is immortal. But Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to become immortal. And in order to do that, this mortal body, it is a mortal body that we have, must put on immortality. So let's explore that idea of, of the hope that we have a little bit more. Starting with um, Romans chapter 6, Matthew, Mark in the Old Testament, Luke and John, Acts and Romans. It tells us there, Paul tells us, Romans 6, verse 23. Well, first of all, he tells us something that isn't that great for us to hear, doesn't he? The wages of sin is death. So all of us sin, all of us are going to die. But then he flips that on its head and gives us the positive. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So again, somehow, because of what Jesus has done, we can get hold of this eternal life. How do we do that? John chapter 6, verse 40, tells us, this is the will of him who sent me, this is Jesus speaking, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So that, that, that introduces uh, one new concept, but it also tells us a little bit more. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. How is that going to happen? Is it going to be because our soul jumps to another person or another incarnation? Not at all. I will raise him up 
at the last day. So there is a way we can live forever. There is a way we can be immortal. It involves, well, first of all, believing in Jesus and, and the message of Jesus. And secondly, the way that is done is by us being raised up from the dead. Another verse just to um, back that up. John 3, verse 16. Perhaps the most famous book in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And note again, there's conditions attached to everlasting life. Those conditions are that we believe in Jesus and the commandments that he has given. Now, if you're still there, I don't think we've, we've moved on from Romans 6, if, if you turn there. Let, let's have a look a little bit earlier than verse 23. Romans 6, verse 3 to 5, um, is one of the fundamental commandments that we are given. Romans 6, verse 3. It's uh, the, the, the act of baptism. Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. So in order to be associated with Jesus, we have to um, symbolically die like Jesus did. Verse 4, so we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we obey this commandment, we get baptised, we, we um, symbolically die. Jesus was raised up literally, of course, wasn't he? Well, in this picture, we're to change our way of life, we're to pretend we've been raised up a new person, we've got to walk as if we're living a new life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of of his resurrection. So that's the wonderful hope that we can have of being resurrected when we do die, of being given the gift of God in verse 23 there, which is eternal life. We have to follow God's way to get to that stage. We've got to believe on Jesus Christ. We've got to be baptized and we've got to then try and live a new life as if we were, were we'd Jesus himself. Now, if we manage to do that in our lives, there's, there's a wonderful chapter. We read it. Let's turn there. 1 Corinthians 15. That tells us more about the, 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 um, the, the physics of what is going to happen. How we become immortal. How we inherit this gift of eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And you see, that, that's something only God can do, isn't it? To have no more death. To be raised from the dead. To be changed from a mortal body into an immortal body. How is this possible? Let's remind ourselves, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of Christ's work, this is possible. 
So, verse 58. Remember Romans 6. We've got to live a new life when we're baptised. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as he know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. So yes, we do have to put effort in. We do have to make a change in our lives. We've got to not do what we want to do anymore. We've got to do what God wants us to do, abounding in the work of the Lord. But the, 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 the reward for doing that will be the gift of eternal life. So, I suppose it all boils down at the end of the day to who do we believe? So at the start, the, the statement of the serpent, civilizations throughout time, what we'd like to think. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And it's an attractive statement, it must be, for so many people to believe it. That this life isn't the end. That there's something that comes after. Well, Adam and Eve fell for that, didn't they? And ironically, they died as a result of it. God tells us, the soul that sins, it shall die. And I think we, we've seen this evening, hopefully, that the, the Bible has shown that we don't have an inherent immortal soul. This life is our only opportunity. We're not going to get another chance afterwards. When we die, that is the end of our opportunity. But the key is that it is an opportunity. It's not without hope. God is willing, he tells us, to give us the gift of eternal life. But we've got to follow his rules on that. We've got to be baptised got to believe in Jesus Christ and we've got to follow his commandments. And if we do that, well, 1 Corinthians 15 has told us that our mortal body can be changed into an immortal body. We've got to remember that we just read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, we've got to do something about it while we can, be dedicated, committed always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labour is not in vain in the Lord, but that he's given us a wonderful opportunity to receive his gift of eternal life. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Tom. What a clear talk, eh? In terms of just looking at that question, every one of us would have thought about that before. Is there such a thing as an immortal soul? We've been taken through the Old Testament scriptures, understand. Let's have a quiz now. What's the Hebrew word for soul? Nephesh. One or two of you were listening. Well done, okay? Nephesh comes 755 times, Tom said. So you can very, very easily then follow that word through to come to an understanding of what a soul is. We learn a soul is a living thing. You no, know, it's just you know, us having life, okay? We're souls, living being. Could be an animal, could be us, okay? Can a soul die? Were you listening to any of this? Can a soul die? Yes. yes. So 
Is there such a thing as an immortal soul? Well, it can't be, can it? Because a soul dies. But does that mean we have no hope? Surely not. No, Tom showed us what our hope is. Our hope is the resurrection when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again to this earth. And when you look at the signs of the times around us, when you see Russia making its move, you'll have heard talks here before telling us about the fact that Russia is Gog, the land of Magog, who's going to come down eventually onto the mountains of Israel. When you see these signs, when you see that Britain has come out of the European Union, as people have been able to show that the Bible's predicted, when you see that Israel is back in the land, having not been in the land for hundreds, thousands of years, now back in the land, as the Bible predicted. When you see that men are fearful at work, I speak to people, they are fearful of the things going on in the earth. And we know the Lord Jesus Christ said that that's how it will be before he comes again. We can be sure that the Lord Jesus Christ's return is not far away. And each of us has a choice. Do we put our faith in the Bible or do we simply put our faith in the thoughts of men? And that's life-changing, isn't it? So when we leave here this evening, let's ponder those things and actually make some decisions about changing our lives. Hey, I didn't mean to get quite so strong about it, but uh, <laughs> it's powerful stuff, isn't it? Now, come on, let's finish with a hymn. Hymn number 409. Glory to thee, my God, this night, for all the blessings of the light. Keep me, O oh, keep me, King of kings, beneath thine own almighty wings. And then we'll say a prayer. Almighty Lord God, we again come to you at the end of our time together now to once again praise you and to thank you. Lord God, we praise you as the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. We look at the stars and realize that you, Lord God, are beyond our comprehension in so many ways. Your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. We look at all your magnificent creation. We look at ourselves and realize that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet, Lord God, despite the fact that you are so great compared to us, we've learned through your word that you do have a plan and purpose with us and that you've not left us in a world without hope, but you've given us hope 
through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord God, no matter what the circumstances of our lives, no what our cultural upbringing has been, no matter what ties we might have had, to have the humility to listen to you, to hear your word, to be willing to make changes to our lives in recognition of the fact that you as the almighty God have asked us to live as you would want us to live. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to that end. And we know that in your word, you've shown to us your ways. And in giving your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you've shown to us your character. And Father, what we see is so good. So help us to have that humility and faith to put that into practice into our lives. And we know, Lord God, that if we will labour in the Lord, then we're not labouring in vain, that you will indeed raise us again when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So may each of us consider carefully the command that we've been given to believe and to be baptised. And we pray, Lord God, that for those who are willing to do that, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, will be great rejoicing for us because we'll be able to go with him into the kingdom and change this whole world into a place where even you can dwell. So please, Father, we pray earnestly for that time and we pray that in the meantime we might try to live by your word. So hear our prayer now. We ask it for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and all that he's done for us. Amen.